Happy Friday, everybody. Welcome to the second seminar of this uh, STEAM H seminar series this semester. Um, some people are trying to join in uh, while I'm doing the introduction. Um, so it's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker today. Uh, but before that, let me just mention one thing. Um, that is, if you have missed uh, the seminar last Friday, right? So we do have a recording of the seminar. And just for this uh, seminar today, we're going to record it and put it on YouTube, right? So let me quickly share with you the um, place where you can find the recording on YouTube. Okay. So this is our channel on YouTube. Um, if you just uh, go to YouTube and do a search Steam H seminar series, all right? So you'll find our YouTube. Okay, and this is our first talk uh, given last Friday by Dr. Graves, right? So uh, that's for uh, last Friday seminar. And again, uh, this semester we have a great lineup of speakers and I uh, hope we'll see all of you in the remaining seminars as well. Um, so I will mention a little bit about um, next Friday seminar at the end of uh, today's talk. So again, as I said, it was a great pleasure to introduce um, our speaker today. Um, my good friend, Igor, uh, we met at actually at the University of Notre Dame when I was a graduate student over there and he was a postdoc uh, at uh, Nora Brzezinski lab, uh, who uh, Nora uh, is a well-known evolution geneticist, particularly on the study of mosquitoes, also on the genomic study of mosquitoes. And uh, well, it's uh, just coincidence a few years, I mean, sometime later, both of us ended up in Virginia. So it's, uh, I'm really happy to have Igor uh, with us today to give us a talk on um, his research. But a little bit more background about Igor, uh, or Dr. Scherhoff, I should say. <laughs> um, he got his bachelor's degree in biology, um, as well as his PhD in genetics um, in Russia. But he uh, again uh, came to uh, the States uh, to do his uh, postdoctoral research. And again, it's at Notre Dame, we met uh, each other and our labs were really close to each other. We often have a journal club at, uh, reading paper together. Um, so um, again, after some years, it's great to catch up uh, with um, Dr. Sharhoff. And uh, at, after his uh, postdoctoral uh, research at the University of Notre Dame, he came to uh, Virginia Tech uh, as a tenure track uh, assistant professor, and then became associate professor and a full professor. And uh, at Virginia Tech, uh, he has received quite a few awards, including the favorite faculty award, as well as um, a research excellence award at Virginia Tech. So again, that shows uh, his uh, accomplishment or achievement in both teaching and research. And he also published uh, many papers as well as some book chapters, um, which of course uh, we don't have time to go through uh, each of them today, but in a short sense, he's very productive um, academically and uh, particularly with uh, his uh, scholar um, research so uh, without further ado, uh, let me give the mic and uh, screen to Dr. Herkov, who will talk with us about his uh, recent research uh, at Hidden Lab, All right? Dr. Herkov, the mic and screen is yours. Okay, thank you, Shantra, for uh, the introduction and for invitation to give the seminar. And thank you everyone who can join us today. So I will be talking about the 3D genomes of human malaria vectors. So first about a few words about malaria. Uh, 
malaria is a uh, basically a devastating disease and uh, actually uh, very deadly disease as well and it caused by malaria parasite vectored by infected female anopheles mosquitoes so males of course don't transmit malaria uh, there are huge tolls of malaria so there are 229 million cases worldwide and more than 400,000 uh, deaths. Most uh, affected are children under age five. In fact, they uh, have 67% of all malaria deaths. The African region, as you can see here, is uh, dispro disproportionately affected by malaria. And it's also very expensive to control and to eliminate in 2019, about $3 billion was spent for uh, controlling malaria. Actually, one of the best methods to control malaria is to uh, uh, control mosquitoes. And that has been the most effective. So my motivation for studying the 3D genomes of mosquitoes come from several points. We all know that DNA in all organism cells is identical, identical. So whatever organ you take, like an eye or liver or reproductive organs, they all will have the same DNA. But the DNA is expressed differently and that's what uh, generates different cell types. And organization of the DNA in the three-dimensional space may actually govern the specific gene expression in different cell types. Also, if we compare 3D genome architecture among different species, we may reveal evolutionary variable and conserve chromatin interactions. What we know about the genome is very important, what we can do with it. And actually, the improved understanding of the 3D mosquito genome may inform us about novel malaria control measures based on genetic approaches. So uh, there is so-called malaria triad because three species participate in the mal malaria cycle. Of course, human, the Anopheles mosquito, and Plasmodium falciparum, the parasite. They all belong to eukaryotic organisms and eukaryotes um, represent this as a monophyletic tree on the tree of life. Among all these three members of this malaria triad, human, plasmodium, and mosquitoes, the three-dimensional genome organization has been only studied in human and plasmodium. So there are two principal methods for studying 3D genomes. First is microscopy. Study in humans identified that chromosomes are not randomly organized in the nuclear space, but represented by as a chromosomal territories separated from each other. Also microscopy in plasmodium identified that important genes such as VAR genes located in the telomere regions of the chromosomes cluster together at the nuclear periphery that facilitate recombination and increase of antigenic variation in the parasite. Another principal method is called HIC, or chromosome confirmation capture. Human, uh, humans have this well-defined compartments and topologically associated domains, seen very well here as a contact map. While in plasmodium, this typical topologically associated domains are lacking. So there are very different organization between these two eukaryotes. And as you can see here, there is no such information for mosquitoes available yet. What we know about chromosomal organization of the mosquito genome is that they have three pairs of chromosomes, two autosomes and sex chromosomes, X and Y. 
So this is a male karyotype. So schematically, we can represent them here, divided by autosomes and sex chromosomes, and as well as by chromatin types, euchromatin, lightly stained, and heterochromatin, brightly stained. Chromatin, euchromatin is gene-rich, active, and heterochromatin typically is inactive and gene-poor after the genome. But uh, of course, this is an iconic uh, picture of the chromosomes, but they look nothing like that in the actual nucleus where they ex express. These are mitotic chromosomes, so they do, do not typically express genes. In nucleus, they are represented as chromatin fibers organized in hierarchical order. And what we want to do here is to apply these two principal methods, microscopic analysis of chromosomal territories and high C study of the 3D genome architecture to mosquitoes. In the first part of my talk, I will be uh, exploring the micro microscopic data using three different species, diverse is a 60,000 years ago or more than 500,000 years. They belong to the same Anopheles Gantia complex, the most important complex in Africa that transmit malaria. And this part has been published in uh, cells. Uh, what we know from studying in other organisms that genome in the three-dimensional space of the nucleus is organized in hierarchical manner. We can see chromatin loops where enhancers interact with promoters, which in turn are organized in so-called topologically associating domains. They form chromosomal territories, and chromosomal territories can interact either with each other forming transcriptional neighborhoods where regions of high expression and interaction with the nuclear periphery or nuclear envelope through lamin associated domains. And here, uh, uh, low expression region. In addition, we know that in human, for example, active and inactive X chromosome has different shape. It's either ellipsoid or spheric, more, more like spheric form. So even shape can be detect, uh, can determine the level of expression. So we want to ask, what are the shapes of chromosomes in mosquitoes? Is it more like ellipsoid and elongated or is it more like round? Also, we want to ask what are cell types differences in terms of chromosome chromosomal interactions. And also we want to understand how these regions of that interact with the nuclear periphery and regions of low expression differ from cell to cell. So for our study, we choose two different cell types. One is a larval survival gland. So, uh, the gene expression analysis indicated several important functions of these cell types. Immune response, food and mouse path replication, nutrient metabolism, and xenobiotic detoxification. So uh, here is a dissected larva, the head, salivary glands, deep gut. And if we extract salivary glands and press them and stain under the microscope, we can see that they have this giant nuclei. When we press them, we can see chromosomes. And the chromosomes are really giant. They are represented by multiple replication cycles of the DNA. And they call polyton chromosomes, which are very convenient for the analysis because of the size. 
The other issue we studied is ovarian nerve cells. Their function is quite different. They synthesize ribosomes and mRNA for the delivery to the oocyte. So they are located in the female abdomen. So female, after taking the blood meal, uh, it starts uh, orogenesis and the nutrients from the blood meal are used for the development of the ovaries. Ovaries grow and follicles cells are very small cells here that surround the follicle and inside there are seven nerve cells which are sister cells to the oocyte and nerve cells provide nutrients for the growing oocytes which will become an egg and again nerve cells have this giant polyton chromosomes which are a very nice binding pattern and they are very convenient for the cytogenetic analysis if we look just at uh, this section through the middle of the nucleus in both cell types, we already see the obvious differences. There is a chromatin-free space inside of the salivary gland nucleus, while chromosomes occupy the middle section of the nucleus in ovarian nerve cells. So, of course, the obvious question, what happened to the nucleolus, which is typically in the center, we stain the nucleus with the nucleolus, and indeed in salivary gland, the nucleolus is in, in the center. While in the ovarian nerve cells, it's kind of fragmented and probably pushed to the available free spaces, uh, while the center of the nucleus is occupied by the chromosomes. But we want to understand further how each separate chromosome is organized in, in this nuclei. So for that, we develop uh, methods based on oligonucleotide probes. We use the Anopheles Gambia genome and designed levels which are spaced approximately one megabase apart from each other along the chromosome length. Then we use 3D fish with these oligopanes and applied these probes to these ovaries and salivary glands in three different species. We used confocal microscopy and analyzed these stacks. And finally, we used our custom MATLAB program to, quanti quant to do the quantitative analysis of the probes. So here's how oligoprobes look like on the polyton chromosomes. You can see that they represent this nice binding pattern and different chromosomes are labeled by different color. In the on focal analysis, you can see that salivary glands have this indeed uh, chromatin free space inside, and the ovarian nerve cells doesn't have this free space, and the, all these labels are nicely represented. Here is a 3D recon reconstruction, reconstruction of the nucleus, and all these labels can be used for quantitative analysis of the chromosomal territories. So here's a workflow to characterize the shape, compaction, 3D positioning of the chromosomal territories. Just here's the experiment where we stain nucleus with a tapi. We have four chromosomal territories labeled with different, different colors. We have our overlay. And then each chromosomal territory, as well as the nucleus, can be represented by convex hole. It's the smallest convex polyhydron encompassing either the chromosome or the, the whole nucleus. So of course the whole nucleus will be like a sphere, but the shape of the chromosomal territories we can study by measurements. So here is a movie that shows you two different cell types, nerve cells and cellular glands. You can see that in salivary glands, there is a huge space between the chromosomal territories. Well, you don't see this huge space in the nerve cells. You can see that chromosomal territories in the nerve cells are more closely related to each other, while salivary glands chromosomes kind of pushed to the nuclear periphery. By measuring three 
radii of the this uh, chromosomal territories. We can see that they are very different from each other in both cell types. And we can measure so-called eccentricity. Eccentricity is basically ratio between the longest radius and the shortest radius. And the average is about three. That means that these chromosomal territories are far from being spheric. They are best characterized as an ablate pancake-shaped ellipsoid. And we also see that the X chromosome has the smallest volume. So now we know that they are kind of flat and ellipsoid, indicating that they are likely all active. Now we want to see how they interact with each other. And here is a comparison of two different tissues and three species. We see that uh, in salivary glands, the number of interactions between different chromosomal territories is typically smaller than the number of interactions in the nerve cells. So the white bars are higher than the gray bars. And we also wanted to see how do they interact with the nuclear periphery. So what we can do, we can uh, measure the distance between each of this oligopatin probe and the nuclear periphery. And here is the distance is indicated by these lines. We used the threshold on, of one micron. If the distance is less than one, mi one micron, then we consider that the contact with the nuclear periphery. And what we found that the trend is quite opposite from what we see, saw for the chromosome chromosomal interactions. Here we see that the gray bar is typically higher than the white bar, meaning that salivary gland nuclei have higher proportion of regions located at the nuclear periphery than in the nerve cells nuclei. But we didn't see any difference between different species. So uh, we conducted this uh, correlation analysis and saw an inverse relationship between chromosome nuclear envelope and chromosome chromosomal contacts. This relationship is especially very good for the autosomes. So the R is minus 0 0.64, which is significant. Uh, but it's also significant when we consider all chromosomes together. So the first conclusion from this work is that uh, basically mosquito chromosomes are ellipsoid in shape. And this can be important because it may allow them to have more contact points with the nuclear neighbors and in order to favor transcriptional activities. And also this can increase accessibility of chromatin. So you can imagine that the spheric chromosomes have fewer contacts in comparison with the pancake-shaped ellipsoids. Second conclusion is that number of interchromosomal contacts is typically higher in ovarian nerve cells than in salivary glands. And also, uh, we can suggest that higher frequency of interchromosomal interactions may facilitate gene expression. In the previous study of gene expression, where people look at uh, percent of tissue specificity, they found that in ovarian, in ovaries, uh, there is a higher proportion of tissue specific expression than in salivary glands. And the third conclusion is that percentage of the chromosome nuclear envelope contacts is actually higher in salivary glands than in ovarian nerve cells. We believe that interactions between chromosomes and the nuclear envelope may determine the contact frequency between chromosomal territories. So here we depicted nuclei from different cell types. These pink circles represent interchromosomal contacts and 
this yellow triangle show chromosome nuclei in the lower contacts. And as we see, there is a reverse, reverse relationship. The fewer chromosome nuclei in the lower contacts may allow for more contacts between chromosomal territories, thus facilitating more transcription. So next, let's talk about the high C part of our study. Uh, this uh, study uh, was put on Bayerhive last year. Now we are preparing the final manuscript. For this study, we used five species. And now some of them are quite divergent, up to 100 million years of divergence. We used, instead of differentiated tissues, we used embryos uh, from 15, 18 hour eggs. We use this eggs for the high C experiment and produce this nice high C maps to study the chromatin interactions. So what is high C? High C is a three C based method. And 3C stands for chromosome confirmation capture. Basically, it has been used already for more than 10 years to study uh, 3D genome architecture in humans and other organisms. Uh, sometime, or actually, maybe sometime even, uh, not sometime, but often. In genomic regions that linearly far away from each other can be close, close to each other in three-dimensional space. And this interaction can be facilitated by the proteins. And we can fix them with formaldehyde. Then, we, using restriction enzymes, we can cut off any unbinding DNA, mark these ends with biotin, ligate them, and remove the proteins. And what we have now is uh, ligated fragments that are normally far away from each other in the linear, uh, in the linear chromosome, but they are now together. And we can sequence them and align to the reference genome and analyze interactions using special softwares. And this high C studies identified hierarchical folding in the eukaryotic genomes. For example, in Rosophila neonagaster, fruit fly, the model organism. You can see the chromosomal territories at one level. You can zoom in and see the topologically associated domains organized in active A compartment and inactive B compartment. Inside of the topologically associated domains, we have loops. And for example, one of the loops is a represented by enhancer interacting with the promoters through the different proteins. So the three-dimensional organization is very important for function of the genome. So how this hierarchical, hierarchical organization have been revealed? So for this purpose, people use these heat maps created by softwares using the data from uh, high C experiments. As you, as you can see here, the highest density of contacts is along the diagonal. So this is chromosome two by chromosome two. More red means higher frequency of contacts. But sometimes you have quite bright, uh, bright uh, dots far away from the diagonal, indicating some uh, interactions can happen between distant, very distant uh, genomic regions. In this case, this distance is about several uh, kilobases. And these contacts or anchors of these loops are enriched with uh, H3K27 methylation mark, which is uh, Represent, uh, representative mark for polycom group proteins. 
which uh, protein that silence developmentally regulated genes. Also, uh, you can see topologically associated domains where frequency of interaction within them is higher than frequency of interaction outside of the topologically associated domains. In addition, if you zoom out, you can see compartments where different topologically associated domains interact with each other. And finally, if you zoom out even more, you can see the chromosomal territories. So we want to ask, what are the predominant interactions among chromosomal territories? From the previous microscopic study, we know that they interact, but we want to know how do they interact and what regions of the chromosomal territories they interact. We also want to know are the mosquito genomes segregated into active and inactive compartments? And also, do, chromosomal, do mosquito genomic regions participate in long distance interaction? So here is our high C map, where you already see the very clear segregation into the chromosomal territories corresponding to five chromosomal arms. If you zoom in into one of the diagonal, you can see that we can identify long distance loops and we can identify compartments. Once we zoom in into compartments, we can see topologically associated domains. Some of them are active based on RNA-seq data and some of them are inactive as well as we see loops even within topologically associated domains and some of the anchors of these loops enriched, are enriched in uh, active genes. So that's indicated loops inside of the topologically associated domains uh, can facilitate gene expression. But what about chromosomal territories? We see very strong interactions between centromeric regions as well as between telomeric regions of chromosomal territories. But we don't see any interaction between telomeres and centromeres, indicating that these two compartments are separated in the nuclear space and never interact with each other. So most likely they're located at the, at the opposite nuclear poles. In addition, we see this perpendicular so-called wings of increased interactions between different chromosomal territories, indicating that they are organized in a rubble-like configuration where telomeres and centromeres are located at the opposite poles. And we wanted to confirm whether this rubble orientation indeed exists in the nucleus. So for that, we wanted to test whether different centromeres are clustered together using fish or fluorescent and situ hybridization. If there is a rubble orientation, then they should, they should cluster. If there is a random pattern, they should not cluster. Our fish so shows that they nicely cluster together at one pole of the nucleus and together with heterochromatin, indicating rubble orientation. Also, we want to see how our previous cytogenetic knowledge about the organization of polyton chromosomes into the euchromatin and heterochromatin uh, is uh, seen in the high C maps. So the heterochromatin here shown uh, by red and blue colors here, pericentromeric and intercalary heterochromatin. And to our delight, we do see these patterns in our high sigma. For example, X chromosome peristomeric heterochromatin seen here is also identified here as a separate domain. As you can see, the frequency of interaction within the heterochromatin is higher and it's separate from the, re from the rest of the euchromatic chromosome. The same we can see for other types of uh, heterochromatin in other arms. And uh, we see that RNA-seq data here and you can see depleted transcription in heterochromatic regions. So uh, in terms of division into A and B compartments, 
we do see them as have been shown in other organisms. Again, the genome is expressed into separate domains, A and B. Uh, as you can see, RNA-seq data has a very clean pattern. So high RNA-seq pattern correspond to the A compartments and lower RNA-seq pattern correspond to the B compartments. This play pattern is very clear. So the, the indeed genome is segregated into active and inactive compartments. Finally, we want to look at loops. We already saw the loops in the inside of the dots, but we also see loops far away from the diagram. In fact, they are, they are huge loops. They are several megabase long. And using fish, we confirm that these loops are indeed real. So here we took one on labeled one anchor of the loop and the other anchor of the loop and colocalize them. And they did nicely colocalize in the interface nuclei. So these loops are quite interesting. Uh, these types of loops actually have not been seen in Drosophila. Because in Drosophila, as I explained to you, the, uh, these long loops in Drosophila, they are polycomplex. But here, we see some enrichment for some loops in, in the H3K27 to 3 but not for other loops. For example, this loop doesn't have any enrichment in this particular histone mark. And uh, they are not enriched in RNA-seq data either, so there is very little transcription going on. So this uh, indicate that these particular anchors, they uh, have low transcription, but they are not silenced by the polycom. And in fact, we found two types of such loops. We found the true polypomp loops, the same as has been seen in Drosophila. There are several kilobases, no hundred kilobases long. But we also found some novel types of loops. They are from five to 31 megabases long, very long. And they don't have polypomp enrichment. So in fact, they can occupy more than half of the chromosomal lengths. So the conclusion from this study is that we found that uh, very strong centromere, centromere and telomere, telomere, as well as interchromosomal interactions between chromosomal territories indicating rubble, uh, rubble configuration. So meaning that centromeres are located on one pole of the nucleus, they're clustered, and telomeres are far away, also clustered. So the rubber configuration would contribute to the reduction of the DNA entanglement by attaching centromeres and telomeres to the opposite poles. So imagine uh, these territories as a pancake shape elongated entities that interact with each other, but they don't entangle. That's what rubble orientation helps with. We also found that mosquito genomes are segregated into euchromatin and heterochromatin domains, identified both in cytogenetic and high C maps. We also found that TATS can be either in IA compartment, and this is associated with high level of gene expression, or B compartment, and this is associated with low levels of gene expression. So A compartment and B, B compartment are spatially segregated in the nuclear space. And finally, we found this long distant chromatin contacts they can span dozens of megabases, up to 31 megabases. Some of these interactions are conserved over 100 million years of evolution, so it could be important. So the anchors of these largest loops are not associated with the clustering of active genes. 
and they also display a low level of H3K27 methylation rich, indicating that they do not correspond to polyform mediated loops. In Drosophila, for example, loops are typically smaller inside and they mainly attributed to interaction between active genes or polycomb proteins. Our data suggests that these large loops found in anophis are formed by other yet unknown mechanisms. So the overall conclusion from uh, these two studies is that they have been actually pioneers in the characterization of the three-dimensional genome organization in mosquitoes and provided the first insights into how it's related to transcriptional regulation. So the functional genomics of malaria mosquitoes can now be put into the chromatin organization context. I would like to thank uh, graduate students who worked in my lab, Jan Tao Lian, Philip George, Nick Kinney, as well as Varvara Lokianchikova. This work was funded by grants from NIH, NSF, and a number of other grants. My collaborators are Alexei and Jake at Virginia Tech, Benjamin, Miroslav, and Paulina from Institute of Cytology and Genetics in Russia, and Rob, Martin, and Livio from the University of Lausanne, Switzerland. A few other things I would like to add uh, here. Since uh, your university is a historically black university, maybe you, your students would be interested in these opportunities. We have in at Virginia Tech two programs, PrEP program and IMSD program. That uh, can be very good for training of minority students. The PrEP program is post bachelor research education program, just one year, and prepare the student to be successful in graduate school. And the deadline for applications April 16. And in fact, my student Philip George was a member of this program and then he became my PhD student. As you can see, very successful. And then IMSD program is actually a PhD training program. So if you're interested, visit this website. Thank you for your attention and I will be glad to take any questions. All right, thank you, Dr. Sharkov, for a very uh, interesting presentation of your research. Uh, now we are open for questions. Any question for Dr. Sharkov? Can I just ask a question? Sure, go ahead. Hey, Igor, this is Daniela. Um, my question is related to the first part of your talk. Uh, I was wondering whether you know where the ribosomal DNA is in the genome of Anopheles, and if that uh, the, the nucleolus that you, you know, the difference in nucleolus uh, shape and, and location is consistent with the chromosome, chromosome interaction and where the ribosomal DNA is. So we know that, uh, thank you, Daniela, for your question. Uh, we know that. Uh, a ribosomal DNA cluster is only on the X chromosome. It's one single cluster. Uh, and sorry, the other question was. Uh, yeah, so, so if it is a single cluster, right, but in the nurse cells, I think then your nucleolus was uh, split in different parts. Right, exactly. So does the X chromosome spread out or? all over those different parts, because that's, you know, the ribosomal DNA should be where the nucleus is. Right, right, right. Yeah, that's an interesting point. Yeah, there are a couple of possibilities could be. One is, as you suggest, maybe X chromosome is uh, segregated into different parts. It's actually polyton chromosome, so you can imagine that maybe different parts of this polyton chromosomes have segregated. But the other possibility there could be originally one large nucleolus, and then it was fragmented later during the nuclear growth. So uh, uh, we have to investigate this using maybe specific probes and see if ribosomal uh, 
region is indeed in multiple regions. But uh, uh, yeah, good point. Okay, thanks. All right, Robert. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, I I was recently uh, uh, at a seminar about uh, uh, holocentric uh, chromosomes and their evolution in, in, in lots of different clades, actually. Um, and I wonder if we have uh, any nice examples like the ones you showed of what's going on in the 3D genome of uh, insects, for example, or, or others, where we know that uh, the the chromosomes are, are holocentric rather than centromere telomere organization. Yeah, thank you, Rob. Uh, uh, I'm not aware of these uh, cases. That would be great to investigate to see if they have even rubble orientation because they don't have some uh, like, like located centromeres. Uh, who knows how chromosomes are organized in those nuclei? Yeah. Very interesting. We put it in the next grant. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Good idea. Any other question? Hey, Igor, I, I do have a question for you. Um, I was just wondering, you mentioned that uh, the telomere to telomere interaction, the centromere to centromere interaction. I was just wondering if those kind of interaction were caused or mediated or have any relation with um, the cluster of uh, repetitive sequences you found in centromere and the telomere. Yes, uh, at least we know for centromeres, they share repetitive sequences, uh, especially autosomes. So autosomes share repetitive sequences with each other, but X chromosomal repetitive sequences are quite different. Uh, although they still cluster together, as far as telomeric sequences, we, we, we know very little about them. But study on uh, one of the organisms, Anopheles albimanus, indicates that they do share common sequence at the telomeres. Mm -hmm. Because they seem to be a general phenomena or, or process, like the um, tandem repeats particularly uh, like to attach to each other. And even transport elements. Um, so, I mean, to test this hypothesis, I was wondering if uh, you mentioned that, um, I mean, heterochromatic region mostly are found in the Central America as well as Central America region. But I guess there should also be some um, repetitive sequences, particularly tandem repeats, found in the long arms of chromosome number two, chromosome number three as well, I assume. So if that's the case, I was wondering if you can test the hypothesis by looking at whether those uh, uh, regions in the long arms of chromosome number two and number three, whether they, uh, where they contain a lot of tandem repeats, they could, uh, that there's a higher level of interaction between them. Yes, Shantra, this is uh, a very, very good point. Definitely, and now with the uh, long read technologies, it is possible to read through the heterochromatic regions and identify uh, all uh, repetitive elements in the heterochromatic. So we can do that definitely. Thank you. No problem. Thank you. Any other question? I have a question, if that's okay. Oh, sure. Go ahead, Phil. Hi, Igor. It's Phil. Um, one question for you. Um, have you thought about doing any types of uh, genomic studies to see how the known um, translocations or rearrangements that we typically look at in the malaria mosquito um, kind of exist in the nuclear space? So for instance, the 2L inversions um, and seeing how they look in different tissues versus different species. Uh, yeah, uh, hi, uh, Philip. Uh, yeah, uh, great point. In fact, uh, we uh, used high C to identify those rare animals. And actually, it's very easy to see them. Uh, these uh, breakpoints uh, interact with each other in the nuclear space, as you can imagine, especially in heterozygous, right? And 
this pattern actually uh, seen very easily. I didn't provide the slide, but it's uh, like a butterfly pattern. Uh, and using high C maps, we actually discovered new inversions that we didn't know about because of these interactions. Uh, but uh, what you are saying about different tissues, different cell types, we have not looked at that, whether they represented somehow different or the same. Uh, basically, for this high C study, we just use embryos. And we do see inversions in, in embryos. Thank you. Thank you. Any other question? All right, if no more question, let's thank Dr. Sharkerhoff for his presentation of, I think, a very interesting research. Thank you again, Dr. Sharkerhoff, for your presentation. Thank you, and thank you everyone for joining in. Yeah, and also thank everybody for joining in. Uh, but before you go, I just want to have uh, a few words about our uh, next seminar. All right, let me share my screen with you, okay. So uh, next Friday, uh, we'll have a talk by Dr. Ellen Gritek. Um, she is the director of bioinformatics at the Parabon Nano Lab. She will talk about how you can use the genomics to solve some forensic problem. I think it will be a great, uh, a very interesting seminar next Friday, right? I hope everybody will uh, join in uh, next Friday as well as for the remaining of this semester, right? Again, Thank you guys very much for um, being here today uh, to uh, join this uh, seminar. And of course, uh, thank Dr. Shekhar for the uh, wonderful presentation of his research. All right, I'll see you all hopefully next Friday and the remaining of this semester. Bye everybody, have a good weekend. Bye, Bye now.